Very good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm hoping that we can have a nice, uh, robust discussion. We've got two hours to talk about um, an awful lot of things as it relates to transportation and technology. Um, you should definitely feel free to interrupt, ask questions, um, and we'd like to have a, a really robust discussion about what some of these technologies mean. Um, and, and what we're going to cover is kind of four main areas. Um, the automation of driving, uh, ride hailing, technology and public transportation, and the sharing economy. Each one is very interrelated, uh, but each one has a very distinct set of issues that um, are, are important when we're thinking about how will our communities develop in the future. Um, I, uh, I'm not here to tell you how you should do it here in Idaho, because you all are the experts in your own communities and your own area, you know how you want your communities to grow. Um, what I'm hoping to do is talk about how others in the country have been approaching these technologies, what the big issues are, uh, and what we're seeing from an actual deployment standpoint. Um, at, at the very end, we have a, um, a, some time to talk about some of the ultra-modern technologies like Hyperloop or drones or flying cars. Um, if, if we want to talk about um, the, the Jetsons of, of transportation. Um, I, I tend not to focus on those because uh, they're, they're not going to happen, um, at, least, at least not in any way that's going to impact our lives in the short term. I know it's disappointing. Um, but but the, the things that we'll talk about now are all things that, that within the next few years we're going to be hearing a lot about, we're going to be seeing on the roadways, um, and it's important to think about how we're going to plan and adapt for them. Um, so, like I said, the goals are, are to understand how this technology is shaping um, transportation across the globe, um, discuss the, the limitations um, as well as the potential of the technology, um, and then create some insights on how you might think this technology could, could be deployed here uh, in, in Southwest Idaho. A um, little bit of background about Eno and about me. So, uh, my organization, we're a, a think tank. We've been around for a long time. Um, the man here is William Eno. He's, uh, he was stuck in a traffic jam in a horse and buggy in New York City in the late 1800s. And he was so traumatized that he decided to dedicate the rest of his life to overcoming transportation problems. Um, and he wrote the first rules of the road. He codified that we drive on the right-hand side. Uh, he invented the stop sign, he invented the roundabout. Um, he's really the grandfather of traffic engineering. Um, and he founded our organization in the 20s, and we've been uh, around ever since, tackling everything transportation. Um, we're not a ideological or partisan or, or any kind of think tank other than one that just wants to see better transportation. Um, so uh, myself, I grew up in Ohio. I um, uh, spent a lot of time on a farm. My mother's family are onion farmers. And uh, there, there's an actual connection where I'm, I'm going with this um, because uh, that, that's a very different experience than where I live now. I'm, I'm one of the, the millennials that lives in the city and doesn't own a car and, and pushes my baby around in a stroller to and from daycare and whatnot. Um, and those two experiences have, have shaped a lot of how I think about transportation because um, it's, we live in a very diverse country. Um, and these kind of technologies and how we deploy transportation um, needs to, to be something that benefits uh, everybody. And, and I believe it can. And one of the interesting things that, that I remember growing up is we were, were on in the field and we're um, digging drain pipe. And we had a laser guided drain pipe. And this thing would go on by itself and it would have, we had a slope where it would go down six inches over a thousand feet and all guided by lasers. And that same concept and that same technology is what's driving the technology push, push on self-driving vehicles today. Um, so a lot of it's very interrelated. Um, and, and we can, can learn a lot when, when we really take a step back. We learn that, that um, the technology that's being deployed on the roadways often has its roots in things like farming and in mining and, and those kind of uh, industries. So anyway, um, so what I want you to, to leave with today is understanding that transportation has its limits and its opportunities. Um, a lot of it's very nascent and unproven, but of, but of course uh, we have uh, we need to have a concerted effort um, to achieve the optimal outcomes. Now we're going to start um, with automated vehicles um, because that's something that everybody likes to talk about. Um, 
But just as, as some reference material, uh, anybody that would like can go to our website, www.enotrans.org. We have a few reports that we published on emerging technology, um, uh, uh, automated vehicles for the federal and, and for local level uh, policy making. Um, and then, of course, anybody that wants to engage social media, if anyone's a, uh, a Twitter fan uh, tonight, uh, my handle is, is, you can kind of see it there at the bottom, it's at Paul R. S. Lewis, and you can feel free to, to tweet at me or at, at my organization, Eno. Okay, so in automated vehicles, we're going to talk a lot about um, on how we've seen a ton of advancement on the very easy part of what an automated vehicle is. Um, I actually think there's a lot to be gained on safety. Um, and, and again, as, as I mentioned at the beginning, we can start planning now for this unknown future. Um, but before we get there, a lot of folks have a hard time uh, defining what an automated vehicle is. Is it self-driving? Is it driverless? Is it driver assist? Is it automated? Is it autonomous? Does it apply to cars or trucks or buses? Um, and what I tell folks is that it's all of these things. There is no one definition of what an autonomous car is, or a self-driving car is. Um, but when we think about policy, we talk about the levels of automation. And I know this is hard to see. This is from the Society of Automated Engineers, and it's kind of the industry standard of how we think about what an automated vehicle is and, and what it can do. Um, it ranges from level zero, which is your 1957 Chevy that is completely manual, everything, down to level five, which is a vehicle that, that could drive itself on all roads, in all times, in all locations, in all weather conditions. And in between, we have different, uh, different approaches. And it's not necessarily sequential, but what the different levels <coughs> define is what is the responsibility of the human and what's the responsibility of the vehicle? So in a level two, for example, this is your Tesla autopilot or your Super Cruise on the Cadillac that handles the steering, it handles the acceleration, it can even change lanes for you, um, but you as the driver still maintain control, you maintain responsibility, you have to be looking around, be very observant. Level three, which is where we switch to the, the, the different color, is, is really the transition between where the human is monitoring the environment and then now all of a sudden the car is. And in level three, the car is self-driving and, and you as the driver don't, ha don't have to pay attention. But when the car dings at you and says, hey, there's something coming up and I'm not gonna be able to drive, it will then transition the, the power back to you. And then level four is something that doesn't need any driver in it and it can handle all driving in a specific corridor on a specific type of roadway. So with that background, um, kind of think about the different applications of how we can uh, see a, a, autonomous vehicles roll out. Um, so then the question is, what's gonna happen, right? And, and folks point to either a heaven or a hell scenario. And I talk to a lot of people that see this, I know it's a little hard to see, and some people see heaven. Right? Look at this intersection. The quantity of vehicles and people moving through it seamlessly, flawlessly is eliminating congestion. It's very high utilization of the roadway. Um, and, and this means that we can get around our communities without huge, massive infrastructure investment. Um, and then a lot of folks see this and they're terrified. You know? <laughs> they don't want to live in that community. They don't want to see that on the street by their house because it's too chaotic. Um, and even though the technology would be working, um, that's, that's not quite how they envision their community developing. Um, and, and there's a lot of predictions out there about what's going to happen. Some say that vehicle miles traveled is gonna go way up because people are gonna be able to live farther from their jobs and driving is gonna become less onerous. You can sleep um, and, and there's gonna be not really a reason to, to worry about congestion because the car is just gonna drive you or everything's going to be shared and the vehicle miles traveled is going to be way down because we don't have to drive as much. We don't own our cars. Um, you know, safety could go way up or safety could, could be in, in jeopardy, right, if, if untested or unproven technologies start proliferating. Um, liability. Nobody knows who's actually responsible. Is it you as the car owner? 
Is it uh, the, the driver, or the, maybe it's your, your, your driver was Uber, maybe it's Uber itself, or, or one of these technology companies? Um, what about privacy? What about ethics? You know, a lot of people aren't quite sure, and you'll hear stories in the media, reports, that predict these really dramatic imports. Um, and, and the bottom line is nobody really knows what's going to happen. Um, and so I, I like to play this video um, to tell people, give people, people a sense of where we are right now with self-driving technology. There's no sound. Um, this was a, uh, this is in Arlington, Virginia, right outside of Washington, D.C. If you look at that van right there as it goes by, there's nobody in the vehicle. Um, there's lights flashing on it, and this was a reporter that happened to be out uh, having a drink with friends, and he grabbed his camera because people are noticing this car going up and down the street without anybody in it. Um, and it was really this incredible media storm. And folks are saying, like, this is happening. We weren't expecting this, and there's, you know, there's nobody in the car, um, and they, they they couldn't figure it out. It was really a, a you know, people were very excited about it. Um, and so it, the, they, they tried to track the car down. He, you know, he wasn't able to run after it. Uh, and, and then it wasn't around for a couple days. And then a couple days later, it was raining, and then they were out. And they saw the vehicle again. Um, and and the, the reporter got in his car, and he chased it down. Um, and he went up to the vehicle. Let's see. That's the next slide. And this, was, this is kind of a hard picture to see. Um, but it was actually a person, a man, under a costume that looked like a seat. And he's, that, those are his arms reaching out. You can see kind of through the rain video, and you see his legs there. So it looked like the car was empty, but it was actually this guy dressed up as a car seat who was driving the car. Uh, and it happened to be uh, a, a researcher from uh, Virginia Tech who was trying to get public perception of what what an automated vehicle is going to look like. Because people don't know how the public's going to react when there's a car going. And it was a media storm. Um, but it also kind of tells you the story of, of where the technology is. And, and a lot of it at this point is in testing phases. And a lot of it's smoke and mirrors. So when we talk about the, the technology that's on the roadway, um, we're still a long ways before we can have a car going down the road without a driver in it that isn't somebody just hiding under the seat. Um, and, and in fact, automated technology has been around for a long time. This is in 1997. That's a picture of eight Buicks rolling down the freeway in San Diego um, with nobody in any of the vehicles. Um, this technology relied on magnets in the roadways. Um, and it was very successful. It worked flawlessly, and it never took off. Why? Because it required a massive, coordinated government effort to put magnets in every mile of roadway across the United States. And we didn't have the coordination or the capacity or the money to make that happen. Um, but why have we seen such an advancement in recent years? It's because of, of this. This is, this is how the cars are, 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 instead of having smart infrastructure, we're having smart vehicles. This is showing all of the different systems that are on a car to perceive the roadway. The, uh, the, the dark blue shows long-range radar. The, uh, the red is showing a LIDAR system, which is a laser radar. Um, we have the gray showing cameras that are seeing it optically. Um, we have the light blue, which is the short, medium-range radar, which is helping to perceive the different cars and vehicles and people and bikes that are on the roadway. And so this, coupled with an incredible amount of computing power, is enabling pretty large advancements <coughs> in cars driving themselves the same way we do by perceiving what's on the roadway and using both artificial intelligence, which is basically machine learning, um, and very specific algorithms to understand how to navigate traffic. Um, expected commercial availability, if you look up here, we've got Uber, Volvo, General Motors, Tesla, Google, they're all developing this. Um, and they're thinking that they're gonna have level three or level four vehicles sometime <coughs> by 2020 to 2022. So sometime in the next five years is when they're expecting commercial availability. Um, there's a lot of skeptics. A lot of folks think that um, those very ambitious deadlines are set to, uh, to help them raise their own stock prices. Um, but, uh, but in reality, this is, this is what the industry is thinking. And so the, the commercial application of this could be very real in the next few years. 
Um, and it's really focused around two different business models. Um, one is personal AVs. This is something that I, we know some friends over at BMW. They're very interested in the luxury market. They want to develop, um, they want to keep cars with steering wheels because uh, a BMW is very fun to drive. But when you're stuck in traffic, it's not. And so you would have the option to flip on a level three or a level four system and let the car drive you to work, for example. Um, the other business model is shared fleets. Um, and this is where, much like a, a, a taxi system or an Uber, where you have a fleet of vehicles going around, you call it on your cell phone, uh, it comes to pick you up, it takes you to where you're going. Um, that's the other business model, and this allows the company to have a lot of control over the vehicles. They own the vehicles, they own the fleet. If something's wrong with the sensor or whatnot, they can fix it, um, and they keep a lot of that control along with the liability that would come with driving people around. Um, in both of these business models, they're not planning on giving it away. So unlike cruise control, where you buy a new car and you can flip it on and it takes you, automated technology is, is something that they're trying to sell you as a taxi trip. So you want your level three or your level four car to drive you to work, it might charge you a couple bucks. You can read the paper, but it's not going to be free. They're pouring billions of dollars into expecting to charge incrementally uh, for this, not as a product, not as a kind of the traditional you're selling a car as an actual physical thing, but you're selling mobility as a service. And the, the mobility as a service is not a one-time business interaction. It's a constant dip back into the pool. Um, and, in, and as I said, both BMW with the personal AVs and the shared fleets like Uber, um, those two models are very much uh, geared on charging you for those incremental trips. Am I losing everyone all right? So yeah. For the personal AVs, are you saying it's going to be like a subscription service or something? Or are you just saying that you have to buy, you buy your vehicle as an extra option to get aut automation on that? Is that the business model? Well, so, so for, for what, what um, uh, BMW is thinking, it would be a, subs a subscription. Um, oh. and, and it might be an extra cost, too, because the technology, the sensors, the computers, everything that would go on your car is a couple thousand dollars more. Um, and then, then that's just for the hardware. For the actual software of driving your car, that would be the subscription where you would where you would have to pay ad additionally per trip. And it might be eventually very cheap if everyone's using it and they kind of have a, economies of scale. But initially, um, it's not going to be free, and it's and it's going to be something that that is cost quite a bit. Um, so then, governmental roles. Um, this is something that comes up a lot: is is what is the different roles? And so. Uh, the federal government has issued the Federal Automated Vehicle <coughs> Policy. Um, this is something the Obama administration rolled out last uh, September. Um, the Trump administration is revising it. They're expecting to release their revised policy this coming week. Um, frankly, with uh, only a few minor tweaks, nothing dramatically different. Um, what this does is it reasserts the federal government's long-term role in ensuring safety. Um, every car on the roadway has to adhere to federal motor vehicle safety standards, um, and local levels are preempted from that. So if Idaho wanted to try and make their own safety standard for a traditional car, they couldn't do that because it would then disrupt what's right now a, a very uh, widespread market. So if, you know, for example, in Idaho, they decided that their steering wheel needs to be 17 inches instead of 16 inches, uh, the federal government would say, no, no. We've, we need to have some kind of consistency across all 50 states. Um, the challenge for uh, automated vehicles is that the, the role of safety still remains, but instead of certifying the safety of a product, which is a vehicle, you're certifying the safety of software and, and an automated system. And so it's posing a big challenge. Um, and it's going to be a long time before the federal government has a permanent safety standard for automated vehicles, but they're working on it uh, right now. How are they going to stop Idaho from putting in putting restrictions in? I mean, they say they can't. Well, Idaho has this history of doing things that the federal government tells them not to do. So, what what is what's the stick to keep the state from doing that? Yeah. So that's a great question. Um, right now, the stick has, for a long time, has been uh, something called pr uh, safety preemption, um, and the federal laws, as they relate to safety standards for the vehicles preempt local laws, and it's been like that for decades.
um, and it works fairly well. Where localities do have a lot of uh, flexibility is in things that they've always had, licensing uh, of drivers. That's something that's always been in the state. Liability and insurance requirements, that's always been at the state level. Uh, traffic enforcement, traffic laws, that's always been at the state level. Um, enforcing safety standards has always been at the state level. So there's still a lot of control um, that states have, but of the actual vehicle and the safety of it, that's something that the federal government has long preempted states on. Right, but I, I guess I'm not asking it right. What if the state says, screw you, we don't want you to have automated vehicles? What, what role is, the, what, what can the federal government do? So that's an interesting question, and actually one that's a, a huge debate right now in Washington. Um, the House of Representatives last week passed the uh, Self-Drive Act. Um, this is a, a, an act that's supposed to do two main things. Um, one is exempt several companies from uh, having to adhere to some of the safety standards. So um, if Google wants to develop a test vehicle that doesn't have a safe, uh, steering wheel, Right. They can't do it right now and put it on a public road because the federal safety standard says you have to have a steering wheel. And so it allows them to be exempted from that rule um, up to 10,000 or 100,000 vehicles. So that's, that's the one. The other is preemption. Um, and written into the, uh, it was a, a passed on a bipartisan basis, um, there is a stipulation in the safety requirements that, that says that, that states can develop their own laws um, but they, they cannot um, ban, or it, it, they, they have to allow um, automated vehicles up to any reasonable restrictions. And the reasonable restriction on automated vehicle language is very fuzzy. Um, and it has a lot of people very nervous because a reasonable restriction could mean an awful lot of different things to an awful lot of, a lot of different courts. Um, and, and that the preemption law is one that's that's um, kind of going to be debated in the Senate uh, for the next little while. And it's unclear where that's headed because you have, even though the bill did pass the House on a bipartisan basis, you have a lot of people very concerned about the unreasonable restriction on automated driving. Um, and so that's, that's one way that the federal government could do it. I'm still back at that video of the chaotic What happens if there's a mechanical failure? <coughs> I mean, these are cars. If it blows a tire, it, what happens then? Yeah, and that's something that, that so a lot of uh, companies are they're all on the road testing it right now. Um, and those are the kind of things that engineers have to uh, account for. So when I, when I talk about <coughs> where we are, they, they've solved 80% of the problem, right? Right, so 80% of the roadways, relatively simple. They're, they're big, they're open, they're all striped. You know, it's relatively simple. And it's taken about 20% of the effort. That remaining 20% of the driving, which is when your tire blows out, when it's snowing, when it's, you know, a traffic zone with all kinds of cones and there's pedestrians, that's going to take 80% of the effort for that last 20%. Um, and, and that's where you have uh, billions and billions of dollars right now being invested by these private firms to, to see uh, how, how we can do that. Um, and the role, I think, of the federal government is to make sure that it can pass all of those circumstances. It can blow out a tire and know what to do. It can you know, see a, a child running after a ball on the roadway and know not to hit it. And that's a very complicated thing to do, and I think that's the role of this, the, the, the safety standard at the federal level. At the state level, um, it's, it's a little bit of the, the Wild West. This map uh, we developed in May is already outdated. This is showing um, states that have different approaches to self-driving vehicle laws. And this is even simplified, um, where you have the dark blue states that don't have any laws. They don't have any executive orders. They're kind of waiting to see what will happen. Um, you have uh, the states in light blue which have put on executive orders, but no legislative action. You have the gray states, which have uh, specific laws that enable testing. And then you have the states in black that have uh, specific laws that enable truly driverless cars not in testing mode. And this is a simplification of, of all of these laws, but it's really to show that each state is having a little bit of a different approach. 
Um, and for a testing environment, it makes sense. But when a vehicle is driving from Tennessee to Kentucky, for example, um, they hit a barrier, a legal barrier. Um, and there's instances where test vehicles get to a state border, they have to get out, they have to unscrew the license plate, put another license plate on, and then continue driving. Um, because of the different requirements where states are saying California, for example, is one that has very specific uh, legislation and requirements for the permitting and the actual testing of the vehicles. So you, ha you have to, every time you disengage, you have to report. You have to have a driver paying attention at all times. In New York, you have to have a police escort each autonomous vehicle test. Um, each law is kind of a different, each state has a different approach. Um, and then other states, uh, I mentioned two somewhat restrictive states, you have a state like Virginia or, or Arizona that say, hey, we want to attract industry. You guys, there's no rules. Come on in um, and you'll assume your liability, but, but we, want, we want you, we want to have an open arm towards mm -hmm. business. Um, two very different approaches with very different outcomes. Um, generally, te these, are, these have been testing on the roadways for the past couple of years now. Um, there's been very few incidences. What's Idaho? Uh, Idaho has not passed any, uh, any laws or any executive orders, to my knowledge. I could be wrong. Did anyone? Okay. Yeah. So I think, I think generally the Idaho approach has been to kind of wait and see what, what other states have done. Um, but there's often a lot of chatter and a lot of uh, work at the committee level in the legislature and then at the DOT to, to try to, you know, to balance out these two competing interests. One, protect public safety, while also encouraging <coughs> private investment. Um, and so states have kind of tried to balance that out. What's Alex's position? <laughs> What's that? What's, uh, I don't, the, uh, what is it called? Alec? Alec. American, American Legislative, Legislative uh, something Council. Council. You're I'm not sure. With that. No, I'm not. <laughs> they write a lot of Idaho legislation. Oh, yeah? Yeah, it's a right thing. It's a very right thing. A lot of organization. Yeah, <clears throat> and, and the, 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 um, oftentimes the right wing, and I'm speaking very broadly here, um, they want to attract business, but there is a skepticism of this uh, uh, in right wing groups. Um, if, if not just for that, but also for um, the, uh, the privacy issue. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, uh, we all have a phone in our pocket that's, you know, Verizon or Sprint is, and Google are knowing where we're going, um, but so will a self-driving car. Um, and that raises some, some mm. big issues about data ownership uh, and, mm. and how does public policy play in there. And that's, that's here. So this is implications for transportation. Um, everything from certification, liability, ethics, cybersecurity, privacy, <coughs> how to pay for it, infrastructure and funding, um, connectivity between vehicles, uh, encouraging uh, research, what does it mean for the workforce, what does it mean for freight. Um, I have slides on every one of these. Um, we can go through some of them quickly and then we can go through some if you've got questions. And uh, you know, can, I'd like to hear some of your thoughts. Yeah. Are there industry standards set up for this? I mean, how do you make sure, you know, it, it took a lot of time, for example, to make sure that computers could talk to each other because they were using the same protocols. So how do you make sure that how a Ford drives is the same as how a Chevy drives so they don't use different ways of driving and then they run into each other? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that happens a lot in between Virginia and Maryland where the, the Maryland drivers drive one way and the Virginia drivers drive the other way. And they hit each other all the time, and it's so, a disaster. Are there other vehicles to make decisions? No, and that's actually a very tightly guarded secret because each one of them is trying to race to, to get something that works. Um, and they're doing it, and that's where the word autonomous, right? Autonomy means no input from the outside. You're doing it it's completely um, you know, isolated. And the approach for most of these companies is not to talk to other cars, but to sense other cars, to see other cars, and navigate without any external input other than through its but own But you still have to make, okay, have you ever driven in, uh, in Pittsburgh, you know, where some of them drive, they take the left turn, the light right away, and some of them they wait until the radio goes through, and then they take the left turn? How, how does the car know which one it's going to do, or how did it, I mean, honestly, the same way you would know, right? It's, it's just you have to perceive and understand and look at that driver and, and see how she's going to turn um, because you don't know. 
and and the technology that's that they're developing right now <coughs> has to anticipate those scenarios because humans are going to be driving cars for a long time. Um, if they're able to develop this technology, it's going to be a mixed fleet on the roadway for a long time, um, and we're going to have to operate. It's not going to be a big bang where all of a sudden we flip a switch and every car on the roadway is, is self-driving. Um, so that's it's going to take a while, and it's a huge challenge. Um, so certification, liability insurance, there was a, a wreck um, uh, just over a year ago. This was a Tesla, an autopilot. Um, there was a, a, a young man in Florida who was, who was the, the car was in autopilot and he was watching a movie um, and the, the car did not see a semi truck pulling out in front of him. The car went underneath the semi truck and then continued to accelerate and hit a tree. Um, the, the man did die um, and it brought up a lot of liability questions. Who is responsible in that case? Uh, what the NTSB found out is that it's actually, it was, it was the, the human, uh, his fault. Um, because uh, it's as a level two vehicle, uh, you're required to be paying attention, even though the car is technically driving itself. Um, you're supposed to be monitoring the environment. Um, but it does bring up a lot of questions. And, and these kind of things are going to continue to happen. The technology isn't perfect. Um, it's a hell of a lot safer than a lot of us in many ways. Um, you know, if you if you look at the history and the track record of Tesla and some of these other um, quasi-autonomous technologies, um, they do drive a lot better than, than us. But it does bring up the, the question of who certifies this technology as safe, who is liable, um, and and what is what what's the role of insurance? And so uh, we talked about this a little bit. Uh, there is a federal role in, um, in the, the federal motor vehicles. Safety standards, um, the state local role of developing liability and licensing and insurance. And this is where states have started to take action. And a lot of states are requiring even testers to have $10 million of liability insurance. Um, they take on a lot of responsibility. Um, and, and then the, the question of harmonization between states. Um, there's, right now there isn't harmonization. Uh, it, it changes quite a bit from liability and licensing and those kind of requirements from state to state, and that probably will be for a long time, but to the extent we can develop kind of a model policy that will help um, the, these, tech, these technologies cross state borders without too much trouble. But then this brings up the question of ethics, and this is your classic trolley problem, and, and a lot of people talk about this when, when we talk about self-driving vehicles. Imagine a trolley going down the tracks, Right now it's headed straight and it's going to kill five people, but you have the opportunity to pull a lever and it would then switch onto the other track and only kill one person. The question is, is do you pull the lever? Uh, and people have been debating the trolley problem since the trolley was invented in the mid-1800s. Um, and, and there really isn't an ethical solution. It's just kind of a conundrum that comes into play with autonomous vehicles because you have a vehicle that's traveling down the road that in some instances <coughs> makes a choice over if, it, if there's an unavoidable accident, does it try to save the occupant inside the vehicle or does it try to save the people standing on the street? Um, and it's a choice that human drivers are often given the benefit of the doubt um, because you try to make the best decision in a very tight time frame. But the theoretical uh, uh, happening here is that you could have a programmer in Silicon Valley decide what choice the car is going to make. Um, and this has been a debate that's been raging. Um, and, and no one has quite figured out what the right response is. Uh, and, and so a couple months ago, an ethics commission uh, in Germany um, really, really dove into this issue and a couple other ones. Um, and they had three really big conclusions when it came to ethics um, that I think are important to, to think about. The first is that there is a government role, and it does, they didn't specify what level of government, there is a government role in insurance safety. So we, can't, we can't rely on the, the technology companies just to, to ensure, to promise that they're safe. Um, they, there needs to be very clear assignment of responsibility, not just legally, but when you're in your car and you flip on the, the guy in the Tesla, 
Tesla wasn't telling him, oh yeah, by the way, you really have to be responsible for this. Um, and, and there's a, a very uh, a big role for the private sector here. And then when it comes to the trolley dilemma, they did a bunch of tests, they talked to a lot of folks in the industry, and they found that it actually really doesn't apply. Um, because the scenario in which a car would have to make that choice is so complex from a coding standpoint that you can't possibly pinpoint a, a line of code that says, you know, turn left or turn right. Um, and really, all code should be focused on safety first and, and avoiding accidents at, at, as the number one priority. Um, and so with that in mind, if we focus on um, safety as, as the number one priority in avoiding accidents, um, if there does come a situation where there is a trolley dilemma, which would be a very rare instance, um, we should kind of reflect on it uh, retrospectively because we can't anticipate what that scenario would look like. Um, that was their uh, conclusion, and uh, they spent a lot of time on it. This is, this is kind of what we've been talking about with folks. But it will continue to be an issue that, that comes up a lot because um, the, the decision is so much in the, in the machine's hands. I noticed you used the word accident. I know there's a little controversy yes. about that in the world now. Yeah, and, and actually, you're, in, in, you're very much right. Um, a lot of folks are saying, well, we shouldn't call them accidents. We should call them crashes or collisions. Um, and and that's, that's becoming the more correct terminology because um, when there's an accident, you would say, well, nobody's in fault. But when we, every time there's a collision, uh, there's almost always someone at fault. And so we need to, to kind of move, and that's, that's a, that's a well-taken point. Um, cybersecurity, yeah. Before the cybersecurity, you were talking mm -hmm. about the German Ethics Commission thought safety should be the main criteria, that, shouldn't, that nothing should open. But you're in a, they're always giving up that. Um, you're driving down the road, the, the computer is or the person is, if you go 55, there's a one in a million chance of a fatal collision. If you go 65, there's a two in a million chance of a fatal collision. Yet, we all go 65 or faster. So there, there's always that trade-off, and we're always giving up safety in order to get what we want out of the car. Yeah. The, the, the uh, old quote, uh, a ship is safe in harbor, but that's not <coughs> what it's meant for. Right. Yeah, and that's, and that's a good point. And, and right, there's obviously some limitations. Um, but we we talked to some folks that have ridden in the Tesla autopilot, and their their biggest complaint is that autopilot drives like your grandma, right? <laughs> it's to the speed limit, to the exact number. It stays right in the middle of the lane. It doesn't like to pass. Like it's very much a passive system. A lot of people don't like to drive passively, um, mm -hmm. but that is how they they've designed it. Um, because that's the way that, that the easiest way they can they can ensure as, as safe as they possibly can be. So that's a good point, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have there been any discussions about how good is good enough? Because I mean, as you said earlier, the systems are replacing an imperfect system in us. We don't exactly have the best accident record, and Tesla, with the primitive system they have, seems to do better than most humans. So how good is good enough in testing this? I mean, the lady brought up the intersection and mechanical failures. Well, you know, we're imperfect. How, how good is good enough in these systems? Because they're never going to be 100%. Sure. Do they need to be 85, do they need 95, 99.99? Yeah, a lot of, so a lot of people have been, been debating that, and that's a performance standard that with this federal you know, certification system that will eventually come out, what is, what, what is the criteria? Um, humans uh, tend to have a fatal accident every 100 million miles they drive. Um, 100 million miles. So it's, it's a, the reason we have as many accidents as we do is because we drive an awful lot of miles. But, but the accident rate in the United States is one death for every 100 million miles driven which is about 35,000 deaths a year in this country. Um, a lot of people have said, well, let's, let's set the bar at maybe 10 times that. You know, maybe that's going to give confidence to folks. Um, but if you look at the aviation industry, um, the bar is set at zero, right? They want zero deaths. Anytime there's any kind of safety thing that happens in aviation, um, it's, it's global news. 
know, CNN will have it on there for months. And, and that shows the level of, of trust that people have in the system. When they're driving themselves, you know, you, we all take probably the biggest risk we'll ever take is to get in the car and drive home tonight, right? Um, you get in a plane, you know, the safest place in this country is in the cabin of a U.S. airline at 35,000 feet. Um, there hasn't been a fatality there in a long time. It's safer up there than it is in your living room. Um, and right, you can fall down the steps or you can have an intruder. Like those things happen, planes don't crash. And it's likely that we'll set some standard for, for these cars, but if, uh, if Ford has a glitch in their system and somebody dies, um, that's national news. Uh, and, and it could very much hurt their brand, hurt their reputation. And we could see ever-increasing standards of safety as we have in aviation hmm. to eventually get to zero deaths. Hmm. Cybersecurity, um, this is something that's come up a lot. How do we deal with hackers? Um, you could imagine a nightmare scenario. This is when a, uh, a, it was very publicized, but these white hat hackers, which are they did it on purpose to, to, as a publicity stunt, they hacked into this Jeep as it was driving down the roadway, they accessed its acceleration, brake, and steering mechanisms and drove it into a ditch. Um, and showing the vulnerability of these systems where if they're on every car and they're all over the place, um, it could be very dangerous. Um, and it's also something that's very difficult to regulate. Um, there's no reason there's a cat up there other than just to make people smile. Um, but, but this is where the industry actually takes the lead. Uh, having very prescriptive government regulations tells hackers how to get around the system. Um, and so it's almost counterintuitive to set specific standards from a government standpoint. Um, and so, so what we've been hearing is that a lot of folks think that the industry should lead it, the industry should be responsible for developing cybersecurity standards, and then the government should say, you have a, a liability responsibility here. Um, so they take it seriously. They are responsible if if every Ford um, has a hack that uh, accelerates every car to 55 miles an hour and turns left, Ford would therefore be responsible for that. Um, and so they take it very seriously. Um, but we haven't quite figured out what the right balance is in this regard. Privacy and data, this one is very near and dear to a lot of people's hearts. Um, there is an unbelievable amount of data that comes out of the vehicle. Uh, they're saying 400 gigabytes or 4 terabytes a day uh, in just just driving uh, data. <coughs> Not to say where you're going, why you're going, when you're going, all, all of the kind of personal data that comes along with as well. As well. And, and, and the question is, is, who owns it? And what do they get to do with this data? Um, and it's a very big question. Um, a lot of people are saying that, that the owner of the data should be the driver of the vehicle. So if you're, um, if you're taking liability and you're driving the vehicle, let's say it's a level two, it's your data. Um, if BMW is driving you and you've, you've switched it on, um, in part because they need the data to make the system better, um, they would own the data. Uh, and especially in the case of, of some kind of crash. Um, but then there would be some kind of regulations to protect privacy. Um, if, if they can't, Google wouldn't be able to sell your data to everybody to know that you know, Mike stops at McDonald's every day, and so the variable billboard, should, as he's passing, should flash to McDonald's so that he would be encouraged to go there over and over again. I mean, you can kind of imagine uh, the, the, the data going haywire. Um, and then another thing that goes into this is that, that these operate on public roadways. Um, I know a lot of you are planners. We're here at Compass, which does a lot of planning in the region. Um, planners could, could have much more accurate plans if they have very, very fine data on where vehicles are moving and how they're moving. Um, and perhaps that's a way that we can uh, strike a deal with some of these automakers and, and tech firms. If you want to ride on our roadways, great. You've got to give us some of your data so we, we know better how to accommodate you. Um, so that's, what, that's a strategy that a lot of cities have been uh, pursuing. Connectivity, I, I forget who was talking or who asked me the question. Um, but, but there is uh, some technology that does allow vehicles to talk to each other. Um, this is via, via uh, short, shortwave radio between the cars, 
or with 5G cellular technology, but this would help not only relay space and time and direction and velocity of vehicles to each other, but it could also uh, be on infrastructure where the, uh, the road is telling you how fast you're, you should be going. This is the speed limit and the light should be telling you when it's gonna turn red and when it's gonna turn green. Um, and this has been an issue because of uh, the standards. How does a Ford talk to a BMW, talk to uh, you know, a, a, an Idaho department, uh, transportation department, talk to a, a, a Minnesota one, right? And that's, the standards is something that we've kind of mired in right now, um, and the fact that it's expensive. And so, you know, there's, there's a spectrum issue. Um, there's the, the V2X, this is vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure, vehicle to whatever. Um, how, do, how do vehicles talk to each other um, and creating those standards? Um, and, then, and then how do we test this technology? And a lot of states have started pilots. Um, uh, Virginia, for example, has a connected vehicle corridor where they're installing 5G technology, uh, companies coming in and putting it on all state vehicles so that they can see, okay, well, having this vehicle connectivity, what does it give us as a state? How does it work? Um, and, and is there any real benefit to widespread public investment in enabling connectivity between infrastructure and vehicles? Um, this one, infrastructure and funding. Um, the interesting thing about self-driving cars is that if they happen, right, first they're, they're not gonna need to park because they're either going to be shared, right? You're going to come up in, in your driverless Uber, you're going to get out right here in the front, and then the car's going to go away and serve somebody else. Or they're, uh, they're going to go park themselves. So if you're going downtown and parking is expensive, they could take you to your office, and then you could say, go park yourself, and then it goes way out to the, to the country and parks where it's free, and then comes and picks you back up after work. Um, that's a threat to parking revenues on which a lot of cities rely on. Um, traffic violations. I've talked about how Tesla drives like a grandma. Well, if, if, it's, if it's programmed correctly, it's not going to break any laws. And a lot of cities depend on these vehicles for a certain portion of their revenue stream. Uh, and then fuel taxes, how a lot of states fund their roadway systems. Um, a lot of these cars are going to be electric. And uh, that means fewer fuel tax receipts, fewer, fewer fuel consumed. Um, and then on the other side, we're going to have increased demands for better infrastructure, for the connected vehicle technology we're talking about. How do we fill that gap? And this is something that, it's not immediate, um, but it's something that, that a lot of cities and, and regions are, are thinking about. Um, and so, what is the needed infrastructure? Um, we talked to a bunch of auto manufacturers and said the number one thing you can do to invest in automated and connected vehicle technology is better mark your lanes, uh, get rid of potholes, improve your signage, and make your signals better, easier to read. Those were the things that would benefit everyone in this room that doesn't have a self-driving car. Um, but they said that's the most important thing. Um, you can see there, there's some cameras here of, of just cars just going over potholes all over the place. That's something that spoofs and fools a lot of the self-driving technology. It's a lot easier when the roadway is very cleanly marked and, and, and it's very easy to navigate. Um, and then also the testing of the connected vehicle technology. If we wanted to update every traffic signal and make it, make it a, have it have a wireless signal and make it a connected, um, it would be on the order of somewhere between 10 and $15 billion across the country. Um, this technology is not cheap. Um, so not only do we have a revenue problem, but we also have increasing expenses. Um, and so we've been kicking around the idea. Yes, sir? Go back on that one. Huh? When you say make the make the markings better, whether it's signs or, or otherwise, are you, are you talking about based on current industry standards, or are you talking about to be to be barcodes and signs? And current industry use? standards. Okay. Yeah. So it said so they can see that the stop sign, and you know, it's reflecting back, and they know that it's a stop sign. They can see the markings on the roadway, so they know where the lane is. Um, not not advanced. That that would almost be in the, the level of connected, kind of the next level, which would be tremendously expensive. Well, they do have a pilot pilot project in one of the states where they're putting hidden stuff on the signs for vehicle cameras. Yeah, and that's what he's talking about. And that 
that could that requires a lot of uh, investment, obviously. But the, and the cars also would need to read the signs that don't have that. Right? That's a nice upgrade. It makes it easier. Um, but there's a lot going to be a lot of stop signs that still don't have that on maybe some residential streets. So you kind of have this conundrum that if you can't do every sign, then then the car has to be able to understand all of them. Um, but that's creepy, though. The signs have things on it telling the cars what to do that people can't see. Well, it's like a barcode. I mean, it's, it would be like like the stop sign would have like a little barcode or something on it. Just like when you go to buy something at, at uh, the grocery <coughs> store and it's got a barcode and you don't know what the numbers mean, but the scanner does. But every stop sign may tell you the speed limit. Every sign out there may tell you the speed limit on that street or something. Right. Give you additional information to make it safer. Hmm. I live places that after a hard winter, there's potholes everywhere. And a car would need to to uh, to adapt that. But what they're saying is that it's the the cars operate much more smoothly if you're able to fill those potholes quicker. <laughs> well, and that's kind of that's kind of the, the, the we we've been calling it. We're um, because of technology, we're making maintenance sexy again, right? Like it's it's this it's something that could benefit this technology, but it has a benefit to all of us as well. Um, so we've been kicking around this this idea for a mileage fee, um, a a small maybe one or two cents per mile on. <coughs> Autonomous driving only. So if you have a car that, that has an automated system and you flip it on, then not only is, is BMW charging for that system, but you're also maybe paying uh, a couple pennies in, uh, in a driving fee that would help support infrastructure. Um, it's much easier to administer because BMW would pay it to the government, um, and, and that provides some level of, of anonymity to, uh, between you and the government, of course. Um, and it could also be significant revenue. I think if 1% of all driving had this, had, was autonomous and had this fee, a one penny per mile would bring in over $300 million. Um, and, and states are interested in this. Oregon's putting together a pilot on not just VMT, but on uh, it, uh, automated driving VMT. Tennessee has a law that says that level three or higher vehicles will have a one or 2.6 cents per mile fee. Um, Massachusetts has an executive order that's looking at this. Um, so states are states are really interested. They, they've been the interest has been peaked, uh, but it's very kind of ad hoc all over the, the country. There's no there's no proposal at the federal government yet, um, and you know there's there's a lot of um, back and forth on whether this is a good idea. But we've talked to some of the technology firms, and they're actually not against it. So they're not going to go and say yes, you have to do this, but but they recognize that. Localities and states need to fund the roadways. This is perhaps a way to um, accommodate some of the, 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 the downward trends that some of the other revenues that, that cities and states depend on are, are going to have. Um, research and planning. A lot of cities, a lot of states are putting um, partnerships with their uh, universities. This is M-City. This is a partnership between the Michigan DOT and the uh, University of Michigan, where they're, uh, they have a mock city, it's a, it's a fake city out in the middle of a cornfield, where they're, um, they're testing these vehicles in, in a kind of mocked up city with all different kinds of environments, and the students walk around and they walk in front of the cars, and they, you know, they, they try to really put it in real world, world scenarios without putting it on the actual streets. Um, so test sites, university programs, and then uh, and then there's also some quarters where they're they're testing them on specific roadways or in industrial complexes to try and stimulate some local business and and also and see what what these could actually do. Um, and then the, the first bullet I didn't touch on, but a lot of MPOs and a lot of regions are putting uh, AVs into their long range plan, um, not necessarily saying this is what's going to happen in 30 years, but trying to put some scenarios together to what could happen so we can anticipate some of the changes. Have you been in one of those? I have not. Have you been in any of them? I have been in a level two vehicle. Yeah, it was pretty cool. And there was, we, we, went, we went about uh, a mile or so and then the system didn't recognize the lines on the roadway and we had to take back over. Um, workforce comes up a lot. Uh, truck drivers, the, the, the operator driver 
is about four million jobs in this country, um, and there's a real threat to the workforce. Um, if everything's automated, that could be uh, a lot of jobs lost, much like we've seen in manufacturing over the past decade and a half, where automation uh, has really been the big, big driver of the decline in, in uh, workers in, in manufacturing. We could perhaps see that in the, the workforce. Um, but we're not. Okay. Yep. Right, and so that's where, um, that's the fear, right, is this massive loss of jobs, but, but we don't think that large-scale workforce replacement is, is likely um, because driving is only part of the job, right? A lot of, a lot of truck drivers are planning trips and doing logistics, and, and of course there's the maintenance and, and the other aspects of it. Um, there is a huge truck driver shortage in this country. The, the trucking industry says that they're, they're short about 40,000 truckers desperately trying to recruit, but it's not an attractive industry right now. Um, the public is skeptical of a, a big rig or a bus going down the, the freeway without anybody in control. Um, and, and the technology for this is, is a couple years, if not a couple decades, away. Um, so what does it mean in the, in the short term? We've been talking a lot about how it could be a, a, a job enhancer, where a truck driver might not have to um, be fully engaged for the full length of the trip. And maybe with, on a rural stretch of highway, he could flip on the automated system and the truck could, could go along and he could stretch and not have to be seated for hours and hours on end. <coughs> or a bus driver could be more of a concierge rather than somebody who's focused on getting the bus um, down, down the freeway. So there's a lot of things that we can think about enhancing the workforce before we think about it totally appending it. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't anticipate some of these things as they come along. Um, freight, of course, there's automated ships, automated trains, automated trucks. We can think a lot about how that will roll out. Um, but I, I like to show this video. This is a video on um, truck platooning. This is, uh, the truck platooning is where you could have two or more trucks following each other via uh, automation very closely together. This is a video of a company called Peloton. Peloton is a um, uh, a technology firm. This is not an endorsement or uh, you know anything other than an example of how they see automation happening from a, a, a connected vehicle standpoint. So what's happening here is these two truckers are on the roadway. They communicate over the CB radio and say, "Hey, let's let's platoon," um, and the system enables the uh, the second truck to follow the first one at 100 feet. Um, and <clears throat> the, 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 the truck in the follow position does not have to use the pedals. Um, still has to steer, but, uh, but, but can follow safely at 100 feet, and the first truck is relaying speed and braking and those kind of information. And you have fuel savings of almost 5% on the first truck and 10% on the second truck as they're able to reduce the drag between them. Um, and so, and, and 